I'm going to talk about uh, CERN, the LHC program, and its international collaborations. Uh, for those of you who do not uh, know CERN and the Geneva area, uh, in this first picture here, uh, you can see the area of Geneva with the Mont Blanc behind. Uh, you can also see the uh, runway of the airport, which is... Uh, laser doesn't work. Uh, which uh, sets the scale for the LHC accelerator. Or actually, I like to call the airport the airplane accelerator. The airplane accelerator is, I know, three kilometers long. The LHC accelerator is in a tunnel 27 kilometers in circumference. Of course, from the air, you don't actually see the accelerator. Uh, what you see is just a few surface buildings. Uh, this red line marks the, where the accelerator is located, but in fact, it's 100 meters underground. So CERN's fundamental mission is, of course, uh, scientific research and discovery. However, right from the foundation of CERN, it's been recognized that there are many other uh, almost equally important missions, uh, technological innovation, uh, spin-offs, industrial collaboration, uh, the World Wide Web being perhaps the most famous example of technical innovation at CERN. Uh, also very important is advanced training, or what is nowadays called capacity building, and I'll describe a little bit later some of the activities that we have in that area, in particular in relation to countries from North Africa, the Middle East, and other developing countries. Uh, international collaboration, as Chris Whelan Smith mentioned, uh, this was one of the primary motivations for establishing CERN in the first place as a collaboration between countries that only a few years previously had, uh, had been at war with each other. And uh, what I'd like to do in the last part of my talk is to describe how uh, CERN has grown from being a European organization to a Europe-led world organization. So let me start off with the... Uh, Wrong. A bit more slowly. Okay. So the basic business of uh, CERN is to study uh, what goes on inside matter. So we all know uh, matter is composed of atoms. Atoms have electrons orbiting around a nucleus. The nucleus is made up of protons and neutrons. Uh, this was all discovered back in the 1930s. Uh, what has been discovered more recently is that uh, inside these protons and neutrons, there are things that we call quarks. The quarks, the electrons and related particles, are the basic constituents of matter. So we, the job of CERN is to study these constituents, understand them better, and to understand the fundamental forces between them. Now, what we have at the moment is a standard model for the inner structure of matter, which was largely proposed by Abdus Salam from Pakistan, whom you see on this slide, together with Glashow and Weinberg in the 1960s. Uh, some of the key tests of these ideas of Salam et al. Uh, were performed in experiments in CERN in the 1970s and the 1980s, and in the 1990s, uh, precision experiments were done, which confirmed that the standard model is the basis for our understanding of nature. So, uh, just to summarize, uh, according to the standard model, uh, there are six different quarks. These are the fundamental nuclear particles. Uh, there is the, the electron and uh, three related, but, sorry, two related but heavier particles. Uh, there are three types of neutrino, and these are, between them, sufficient to make up all the visible matter in the universe. Uh, the forces between them, uh, two of them are very well known. There's gravity, there's electromagnetism, which are known from microscopic scales. Inside the nucleus, there are nuclear forces. There's a strong nuclear force that holds the nuclear together and the weak nuclear force that creates some forms of radioactivity. So this is, uh, if you like, the, the underlying uh, content of the standard model. Mathematically, it's just about possible to, to put the structure of the standard model on a t-shirt. So what you see here is a t-shirt with the standard model on it. The top two lines are the lines that have been established in experiments so far. The two bottom lines are parts of the standard model that have not been tested, and those are perhaps among the principal objectives of the LHC. 
as I said, the standard model uh, is sufficient to explain all the matter that is visible in the universe today. There's other matter that is invisible, but that's a different story. So what are the questions which we are now have beyond the standard model? Uh, we want to understand uh, why some particles have mass and some do not. That's the two bottom lines on my T-shirt. Uh, is there something which we call a Higgs boson, which gives masses to the other particles? Why are there so many different types of matter particles? Why are there three neutrinos rather than two or 65? Can we unify the fundamental forces? This was the dream of Einstein in his later years. In the first half of the 20th century, Einstein formulated general relativity, uh, other people formulated quantum mechanics. But in the almost 100 years since then, they've never been combined. So these are the questions that we particle physicists are addressing, and the LHC is the tool that we built for the world to address them. So this is a picture of the LHC accelerator in its tunnel. It's rather like the Sesame project that Chris Whelan Smith described, except that it's dozens of times larger. It's, uh, as I mentioned before, in a tunnel almost 27 kilometers in circumference, on average about 100 meters underground. It's going to accelerate protons rather than electrons. Uh, the proton energy corresponds, roughly speaking, to five trillion AA batteries connected end to end, if you can imagine that. That would give you the energy of the protons that we are going to be colliding, uh, we hope, up to a billion times a second. So the, the principal objectives of this program are the origin of mass, the nature of dark matter, the primordial plasma that filled the universe, uh, the small differences that exist between matter and antimatter, I'm not going to concentrate on the science, I'm going to concentrate more on the, the project itself and the international collaborations. So the accelerator components have now been installed in the tunnel. This first picture shows you one of the magnets being lowered into the tunnel. And the second picture shows you one of the magnets being installed in its proper place around the ring. A non-trivial job because there's something like 5,000 magnets to be installed. That's all been done, and now the engineers in the process of commissioning the LHC accelerator uh, are planning to make first collisions in a few months' time. Now, I said that CERN has evolved from a European organization to a European-led world laboratory, and there have been significant contributions, largely brokered by Christabel and Smith sitting there, significant contributions to the LHC accelerator coming from other countries around the world, uh, including, for example, Pakistan. Uh, yesterday evening, I took a screenshot of the current status of the commissioning of the LHC. Uh, what you see here in blue are the parts of the accelerator that are currently being cooled. Uh, the machine is divided into eight sectors. It's 26 kilometers. Each sector is three kilometers long. Four of the sectors are currently being cooled. Four of them are still awaiting cooling. A month or so ago, uh, there were the first full powering tests of all the magnet systems. I remind you of this 5,000 magnets, so there's an incredibly large number of power circuits which have to all work together, and they've been commissioned up to a beam energy of 5 TeV. Also demonstrated last month, was the squeezing of the beam so that you could actually make collisions. So all this is progressing quite well. Obviously, there's always a few problems that you haven't foreseen, uh, but this shows you the uh, current schedule uh, established a month ago, which foresees putting particles into the, beam, into the uh, accelerator towards the end of June and hopefully getting collisions within a couple of months of that. Now, this is, again, the accelerator now in a cutaway view. Uh, it's on average 100 meters underground. And around this 26 kilometers, there are four points where the particles collide. And at each of those points, 
there is a large detector built by a very large international collaboration to observe the collisions. So this is one example. This is one of the two largest detectors called CMS. Uh, complicated detector. It's design, designed a little bit like a cylindrical onion where each layer of the onion uh, has a function of detecting a different type of particle. Now, a very complicated detector built by a collaboration of over 2,000 physicists and engineers from something approaching 40 countries around the world. And I'd like to highlight the fact that several of those countries come from this region. Uh, so there are countries in this region who have contributed equipment, hardware to this detector and who are now waiting to analyze the results. Uh, last week I was uh, in the cavern 100 meters underground that houses CMS and this is a, a picture that I took. It's not a professional picture, I apologize for that. Uh, the detector is almost complete and if you look for the scale, up in the top left-hand corner, the top left-hand corner, you see a uh, pedestrian walkway that sets the overall scale for the thing, which is something like 15 meters tall. The Atlas detector is uh, even bigger. It's uh, almost 50 meters long, about 25 meters tall. Uh, again, put together by a collaboration of over 2,000 physicists and engineers from around the world. And here is another amateur picture uh, showing the current status of Atlas, which is almost complete. And again, at the top of the picture, you can see a pedestrian walkway with railings. So this sets you the, the human scale uh, of these detectors. Okay, so that was the scientific motivation and where we are with the accelerator. Clearly, to build all this, one needs considerable technological innovation, and that's what I'd like to discuss a little bit now. So one of the key issues with these thousands of strong collaborations from dozens of countries around the world is sharing data. And uh, there's been a lot of talk at this meeting about the World Wide Web, and I just wanted to spend half a minute to remind people that the World Wide Web was invented at CERN in order to enable CERN physicists to collaborate uh, was actually Chris Wellen Smith, while he was Director General, who agreed that the World Wide Web should be made available to the whole world, uh, and the rest, as they say, is history. So now, as has already been discussed, we're moving on from the web, which enables you to share document and access data, to the grid, which will enable you to construct powerful virtual computing systems online. So you've already had a session on this. I'm not going to insist on it in great detail. As you've also heard earlier on this morning, the grid uh, has uh, many applications uh, to environmental modeling and so on and so forth. And the European Union, via in particular its EGEE program, has provided a lot of support to this. It's provided support, but to whom? It's actually provided it to CERN. CERN has been the major coordinator within Europe of the European grid efforts, precisely because particle physics has tremendous need for data processing capabilities, which can only be provided by this distributed grid technology. So uh, we are taking the lead in developing and deploying this. All the other sciences are benefiting from it. One application is modeling the environment. I put in this slide because we had this discussion yesterday about global warming. Uh, the grid is one of the technologies that you might want to use in order to analyze the impact of global warming in different parts of the world. That's not the only application of uh, CERN technologies. I, I could spend a lot of time discussing detector technologies, positron electron tomography, medical technique, which was to some extent pioneered at CERN, uh, MRI and PET are particle or nuclear based technologies which you can improve and make more sensitive using model, modern particle detector technologies and we have groups who are deploying those to the interested medical communities. Training. 
So CERN is engaged in many aspects of uh, capacity building, uh, starting all the way with high school teachers, moving up through undergraduate students, through graduate students, postdoctoral researchers, and uh, professional researchers. And uh, these activities clearly were developed initially with the member states of CERN in mind, but increasingly we're expanding this to include people from non-member states, and in particular, people in the North African and Middle Eastern region. Uh, and in this respect, I would like to highlight a couple of our programs. Uh, every year, we welcome something like 200 undergraduate students as interns at CERN, and by now, something like 40% of those students come from non-member countries and a significant fraction from North Africa and the Middle East. Uh, about 10 years ago, uh, when I was chairing the academic training committee at CERN, we started up a program for uh, high school teachers. It started off with 20 or 30 teachers. Uh, this year, we're expecting almost 2,000. So this is a, a brief summary of the training programs in uh, 2008. Something like 200 students in total. The member states are 60% but we will also have participation from 30 non-member states. And here I've highlighted uh, students coming from uh, developing countries and from countries in this region. Uh, we've also got funding from UNESCO to uh, extend to non-member states participation in our high school teacher program. And they've also uh, agreed to give us funding to clone digital library techniques which we've developed at CERN. And uh, here in parentheses, I've just noted a few countries with whom we've already started collaboration in the area of digital libraries. So CERN is very much involved in capacity building. Uh, one example, obviously, being Chris Welland Smith himself, who started off as a CERN fellow, went on to become director general, and is now uh, director of laboratory in the UK, chair of the Council of ITER, chair of the Council of Sesame, and so on. Um, another example is Adel Trebelsi, who will be talking a little bit later on, who got his PhD working on a CERN experiment in the 1990s and uh, is now directing a nuclear institute in Tunis. So international collaboration, just to finish off. So here you see a, a distribution of the CERN users. These are scientists and engineers registered as working on CERN experiments. Uh, as of two months ago. So, so the total number is uh, somewhat over 9,000. Uh, most of these scientists are based in their home universities and institutes. They come to CERN occasionally, but mainly they communicate with CERN electronically and they need the internet, uh, they need the extensions of Géant in order to be able to do this. So we've got somewhat less than 6,000 users uh, in the European member states in blue. Then we've got uh, something approaching uh, 2,600 from external observer states that have made significant contributions to the CERN infrastructure. And then we've also got several hundred coming from other states with whom we've entered into international agreements. So we have agreements, agreements with many countries in Latin America, uh, also in Asia and Australasia, uh, somewhat fewer in Africa, but this is an area where we're currently developing connections. So a specific interest to this meeting, uh, what is the regional participation at CERN? Uh, there are scientists in the region, some of them in this room, involved in the big experiments, Atlas and CMS. There are also uh, engineers from Pakistan, Saudi Arabia, and Turkey involved in our accelerator R&D programs. Two countries in the region are observer states. We have international cooperation agreements with a number of countries, uh, including one that we signed just recently and two that we're going to be signing later on this month. Uh, we have a collaboration with ICTP that hosts a uh, group working on uh, one of the LHC experiments, including people from Algeria et al. Uh, we had a workshop uh, in the United Arab Emirates uh, in November of last year, which was an extremely valuable networking uh, opportunity. 
and in fact it enabled us to establish contacts with some of the other countries in the region such as uh, Kuwait, Lebanon which you'll be hearing from later, uh, and Qatar and uh, okay, we have other contacts. So that I think terminates what I wanted to say except that I just wanted to finish with a, a few images of some of the uh, people from your region who are collaborating with CERN and uh, we look forward to having more collaborations with the region in the future.